we have arrived. This is Webb Parton, your host, and we welcome you to the Free Range Dogs podcast. This is a place where we stake out a shady spot and talk about all things dog. Find yourself a soft piece of grass, spin a few circles, plop down, rest your feet, then join us in this joyful conversation. Hi, this is Webb Parton with Free Range Dogs. And I want to talk with you a bit today, and it's going to be a different sort of circumstance, because normally I have a guest. But tonight, I want to talk with you specifically about what I think is uh, one of the most fundamental and important training tools that that we can use when we work with our dogs. And it's the sort of thing that uh, we just sort of take for granted. And that specifically is rope. You know, there's uh, a whole host of different designs of leashes and leads and harnesses and and all the ways that you can connect with the dog and all of them are kind of style related and uh you go in a retail store and it's sort of mind-boggling what i have found what my early experience was is that really the simpler is better and i i know as a boy uh i was babysat at the house of the uh caregiver for the Salinas rodeo and at some point in time and I would have been about seven years old at that point. Someone gave me a hunk of rope. Uh, I used to come from school and walk to the rodeo grounds, and I would walk through the back paddocks and kind of see where the, you know, the magic happened. And Salinas is a big uh, bull riding venue, so they had some large animals back there. But uh, you would see, you know, all different sorts of stuff happening, and all of it was related to a rope. At some point, someone gave me a piece of rope, and it, you know, I wasn't that tall in those days, so it might have been eight feet long, maybe. It was an old throwing rope, the old-style ones that were thicker and heavier, sort of circular, built like electrical conduit, the way it was spiraled as it, uh, as it came apart over the years. And it was probably a big, thick, heavy rope. It was maybe an inch in diameter, probably, because they were using it on bulls and, and heavy animals. But... Boy, I carried that thing for years as a kid, uh, and it had a loop on the end, and I, <laughs> I just threw it over everything. You know, rope is kind of basic to me from the earliest time, but it is the way that we connect with the dog. I wanted to talk today about how to use a rope and how to pick a rope. And there is a profound difference here, because you notice I'm using the term rope. In the bird dog world, we use the term check cord. Essentially, what you do with a rope or check cord is you attach it to a dog and the dog drags it. It's not like a leash that you click to the dog and you hold the end of it and the dog is under control because they feel the tension on that rope. And maybe that's the thing that's fundamental to this is that when you are holding a leash and it's attached to your dog, you are in control. When your dog has a check cord or a rope attached to them and they're dragging it, they are in control. Ideally, when you're working with a free-range dog and you need a dog that's going to be out there running with you and, and keeping track of you, the fundamental concept is that it's the dog's responsibility to keep track of you and not your responsibility to keep track of the dog. And certainly you, you'll get a sense of that. You'll hear their position from time to time. You can kind of track them and follow them. But our dogs will cue in and they will go out and make loops and use the air, swing back around, come in behind us, pick up our scent trail, come forward, go past us, go out to front again. And so their job, what they need to learn how to do is to keep track of the human that they're with. And so Let's talk a little bit about that tool and, and how we use it. Now, ropes come in different diameters, and typically the thicker the diameter on the rope, ideally the more comfortable it is to hold in your hand, but it's also more cumbersome. And so the thicker, the heavier, the harder to deal with. I use a lot of ropes in training, and so I typically use a fairly small gauge rope, and that would be a uh, three-eighths of an inch or even half an inch, depending on what we're doing, I use bridle rope. And it's something you can get through feed stores or anywhere where you can buy saddles or throwing ropes. Bridle rope 
is a stiffer rope. And that is important because unlike a leash, where you're holding the end of it and it's only six foot long, maybe up to eight feet long, a check cord is anywhere from 10 to 20 feet long, maybe 30, depending on what sort of work you're doing with it. And that long length of rope being dragged behind that dog, if it's not stiff, if it doesn't have a a structure to it, it's going to wrap around stuff and it's going to hang up on stuff and it's, it's going to be a nightmare to use. And so we need very stiff rope if we're going to be using a check cord. Now, bridle rope, it comes in a little bit thicker diameters as well. Uh, The other sort of rope you can use is climbing rope, and it tends to be much more expensive. But if you can find uh, old, worn-out climbing rope, it works just fine for for, uh, dog check cords. If you look and you go to buy uh, something called a check cord, more than likely it's not going to be adequate. More than likely it's going to be a limber polyethylene rope, uh, very limp, and it won't really suit the the goal that we're going to put this thing to, the way we're going to use this tool. The trilogy in training is point of association, contact, repetition. That means find a spot to touch a dog or a way to touch a dog, and then touch them there, and then do it repeatedly until the dog goes, oh, so that's what you want me to do. And so that point of association, that trilogy is the thing you, you know, when I'm working with a dog, I'm, I'm constantly kind of monitoring that. I'm asking, okay, what am I asking this kid to, to do? How are they feeling it? And have it, I done it enough so that they're not confused anymore? And when we use a rope, that's tension from the rope. The beauty of a check cord is that when you do need to use it as a lead or a leash, and you do sometimes, you can coil it up, and let's say you're running a 10-foot rope, 15-foot rope. You coil it up to the length that you need the dog to be, maybe six feet away from you, maybe eight feet away from you, and you hang onto that coiled-up section of rope, and you use it like a lead. And you hold it with your hand, and you maintain a tension through the rope between your hand and the dog. and. If you talk to show ring people, the folks that are running dogs through the different uh, AKC shows and, and show ring stuff, they will tell you straight up that that connection from the hand to the dog's neck or harness is just like an electrical conduit. The dog reads everything through the tension in that rope. So when you're holding that rope, that rope has weight as it loops down and goes to the dog's neck. And when you stop, the dog feels that tension. When you go forward and the tension relaxes and the weight shift changes, the dog knows that something else is happening. And so the fundamental effect of that is that when a dog is wearing a lead or a leash, they know they're supposed to heal. They know that mom or dad is attached to them and mom or dad is monitoring them. And mom or dad wants them to stay within that, that length of connection. Now, that can be a problem if you're on a trail somewhere and you want to cut this kid loose to run. And you'll often see that early on with uh, young dogs. They're not quite experienced. And you get out there and you kind of sort of cut them loose. And they don't quite know what to do because they've never experienced that kind of freedom. So you'll see them hesitate. Um, and you'll have to build that confidence and get them to move out. Now, sometimes you have the other problem and they just say, see ya, and they're gone. But because you're using a different kind of tool, because you have the option to let go of those coils of rope and drop it to the ground and let the dog drag that rope, then it becomes a check cord. And the benefit is that with a check cord, you're hands-free. You are no longer connected to that dog. The dog is dragging that rope, and the dog feels that freedom, but the dog doesn't feel connected to you because of that rope. The two of you are now independent. And the real benefit is that when you do use a check cord, 
you still have a great degree of control and connection with the dog. It's just that you aren't as accountable to the dog for it. When we use a check cord, we don't use our hands. Primarily, we use our feet. And so you don't have to chase a a lead or a leash that's bouncing on the ground six, eight feet away from you trying to catch up to the dog. You have an adequate length of rope, and that might be 15, 20, 30 feet. You have that adequate length of rope behind the dog that the dog is dragging. And at any point, you can just put your foot on that rope and stop the dog's forward movement. And if you need to get to the dog, you just walk up it like your high line wire at a circus. You walk up that length of rope to the dog so you can physically put your hand on them. You can do what you need to do to get immediate contact with them. You also have the option of stepping on the rope and then kneeling down, picking the rope up, and bringing the dog back to you. Let's say you're working on a retriever training drill, something like that. So that's something I try and talk with my folks when we're in trainings, uh, talk with them about, because <laughs> we're, we're kind of stuck, you know, with using leads. And it's a conscious thing to realize, oh, I don't have to hold that anymore. I don't have to grab that anymore. And uh, you need to sort of train yourself to use your feet as opposed to your hands. Now, that gets us to the point of talking about the rope in particular. And I had mentioned uh, earlier that, you know, different diameters, stiffer rope. There are other types of shapes. Um, I've I've heard the the term drag line used. Sometimes folks will refer to a check cord in that way. And some folks will use nylon webbing as opposed to rope. Now, some of that webbing is fairly stiff. But none of it is as stiff as you're going to find that you really need. Um, Short of one nylon webbing that's coated in plastic or nylon, I've heard the term biothane called, you know, when folks were referring to that. That means it's flat and it can be dragged fairly well. I have used the type of pneumatic airline. Again, it would be the same sort of biothane type of coating. Uh, but it's very stiff. Um, the one benefit of both of those, that whatever has that plastic coating on it, is that if you're in an area that has some rough vegetation like cactus, choya, cat claw, some seed heads can, can be fairly formidable. Um, if you're dragging a rope through that, they're going to pick that stuff up. And so if you're stepping on it, it's not that big a deal. But when you're handling it, you run the risk of getting jabbed pretty good or, or cut up pretty good. I typically, when I'm using a check cord in the field, I have gloves on. And I make a point of handling it with gloves, a stiff rope. And it doesn't want to bend. It will track very well. Your dog will be able to run with it, pull it through things, and it'll snake right through and not wrap around stuff. One of the old bird dog tricks when you are starting with a new rope, and let's say you find the proper type of rope that you want to use, be it climbing rope or be it bridle rope or or be it uh, some kind of a very stiff rope, then one way to help that is to just find yourself a puddle of mud, put more dirt in it and stir it up a little bit, throw that rope in there, leave it there for a couple hours, let it soak that stuff up, let it soak that dirt into the fabric of that rope and get it coated real good, take it out, hang it on a nail, let it dry, and then whack it a time or two against something hard, and you'd be amazed at how much stiffer it gets. And it will really set it for life. It's a way to season it, almost like you'd season a frying pan, and that allows it to be the as good as you're going to get from, from that particular rope construction that you're using. Now, you're going to want to do something with that rope to attach it. And this is important because where you attach a rope on a dog determines how it drags. So if you're using a neck collar, what it typically do is it will find the weight. You know, you're going to, on the end of that check cord, you're going to put some sort of a snap. I use a snap and then what's called a uh, a rope clamp that will take the two pieces of rope that have folded back upon themselves inside the loop 
you put the, the snap, the end of the snap, and then typically what I do inside that loop is I also put a welded ring. So there is an additional loop there, additional way to bring the rope back through. Then I put it in a vise, clamp it down. Some people will put a little length of, of nylon rope in there as a, a little length of shorter, thinner diameter rope that you can use as a tie to coil the rope and tie it together. That's certainly an option if, if, if that's what you want to do. But because you have that welded ring, you're able to snap that lead to a dog's neck collar, the D-ring in a dog's collar, and then run it back down around the dog's body and bring the end of the rope up and bring it through that loop. So you're, in effect, creating another loop that wraps around the dog's chest and reroutes the end of the rope so that it goes back up to the top of the neck and then runs back off the dog's body. And that eliminates dragging that rope in their feet. Sometimes a dog can, can get tangled up, depending on the rope, uh, if that rope is sort of bouncing around and they're, they're trying to get through it. If you can dangle it so it's running off the point where it is leaving the dog's body is at the shoulder blades, depending on how you do it, it could be at the side of the dog, about where the dog's scapula would be, then it's a real easy drag. And when there's tension on it, you know, when you step on the rope, it tends to cinch and tighten a little bit around the dog's chest. You don't get that shock effect that, uh, you know, if you step on it and they get to the end of the rope and it yanks them a bit. So there are options that you want to look at when you finally locate the rope you're going to use and then how you're going to rig it so that it's available to hang on the dog and to stay there. Now, there's different options with the hardware you buy. You can get it in a stainless steel, you can get it in a zinc coating, you can get it in a brass. So typically, the more expensive leads you buy will be brass just because it uh, doesn't corrode. But it just is a, a personal choice. It just depends on, on how you want to do that. Now, it's important to note that when you're using a rope, you are communicating with the dog. And as you recall, I, I mentioned the, that trilogy, those uh, point of association, contact, repetition. When you are doing that, you are communicating with the dog. And that, if you're holding the rope or you're stopping the rope, there's tension from that. But there's also other ways that you can do that in conjunction with using the rope. And so it's important to always be conscious of what you're telling a dog. And if you're just walking with your dog and you're holding a lead, we don't think to look at it in those terms. But in truth, you are talking to that dog because they're feeling that rope and they're, they're feeling what you're feeling through that rope. And if you're going to be an effective trainer, then you need to be conscious of what you're giving at all times. And so, if I'm working with someone in training, I try and make the point to them that there are other ways to connect with that dog just effectively, just as effectively as if you're connecting with a, with a lead or a rope, a check cord. And that could be a, a voice cue. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to be words. Most often, words aren't as effective. I tend to use just auditory cues. Oh, oh, uh, it's the same thing as pulling a rope. If you pull a rope to you, and the dog comes to you, and the tension goes out of the rope, the dog knows it has completed the expectation. And so I will often use an auditory cue to let the dog know that there is an expectation that they have not yet complied with. And once they meet that expectation, then the audio cue stops. And it's a very effective way of communicating a dog in a way that's the least confusing. So you give a dog a command, you institute an audio cue, uh, you use your rope to reel the dog in or to stop the dog. And then when the dog complies and does what you want them to do, then you stop the audio cue and the dog realizes that they have complied. And really the advantage to, to having a clean rope is that if you are 
having a dog drag a lead or a leash that has a loop on the back, it's going to chew up. It's going to get pretty shredded. And a rope is a renewable thing. I know that when I'm in trainings, we'll have young dogs in. You don't, you don't watch them quite close enough. And uh, boy, it just takes a minute for them to roll it back into their back jaws and, you know, bite it off or bite, nearly bite through it. So it's a pretty simple thing. You just undo the hardware and, you know, take about six inches off the length and redo it and you're brand new again. Same thing happens with the end of a rope. It'll kind of uh, fray and it'll look like uh, pants that have been worn too long that get sort of bushy at the bottom. You know, you'll see brush pants do that uh, if they've been worn for a lot of years. And uh, it's like having split ends in hair. <laughs> you cut off that, that inch or two and, and uh, hit it with a uh, flame, propane torch, and uh, just clean it up and you're good to go. Let's see if we can't put this all together then. Because we've talked about a rope and how we use it and why it's important. And I talked a little bit about, you know, the training process, the philosophy behind it, that sort of thing. But let's actually put this into play now. Because you have your dog, and you have been concerned, you're worried about them. When you're out and about, you want to hang on to them. You don't trust that they're going to be okay. Uh, And so you want them within six feet. You want them on the end of that rope. And how do you make that transition? Because you've got to give them the freedom and the autonomy to stretch out and to move on their own. And that's a big leap. I I know it is. And uh, you certainly want to be conscious of where you're at. You don't do that in a city. You don't necessarily even do that in a park or, you know, within a city. Because the one thing that dogs don't mix with are motor vehicles. And it's amazing how fast they can cover ground. And you don't want them running out and, you know, getting in up underneath the vehicle. So uh, you're going to need to be conscious about where you're going to have these initial exposures. And that, that's going to be out where you would normally hike with a dog or, or uh, out in, in the country or, you know, out here we have national forests, we have uh, state trust lands, BLM lands. But you basically want lands without roads is what you're looking for. And so you are going to go out and you're going to need a bit of a bridge. You've had that dog on a leash. He's been within six feet of you. You've been trusting that your eyes are going to keep you and him safe within that six-foot perimeter. And now you're going to turn him loose, and, and hopefully you've, you've done the appropriate, you know, aversion trainings and such, uh, or you're in an area where it isn't uh, as, as severe an issue, and things like snakes and porcupines and, you know, all the other sundry critters that you can run into. And so uh, you've got to let this guy go. and probably the best way to do that is to hang a check cord on him. Now, you might want to use some kind of structure. And by that, I mean, uh, some find some geography that will help you. And that might be a, a two-track in a stretch of national forest. It might be a, an ag field that has mowed strips in it, that you have ground that has a natural length of path that the dog will tend to follow because it's the easiest way to go. If you're on a two-track and there's trees on both sides, it's going to go down the two-track. If you're in that field and, you know, it's stubble or alfalfa or whatever you got and that it's, you know, two, three feet high and there's a mowed strip along it or a mowed edge on it, they're going to stay out of the thicker stuff and they're going to go into the, the low stuff that they can run in. And so you want to transition there probably and, um, and see how it goes. Now, that's scary stuff. I know it is. And you're going to find that it isn't nearly as scary as you think it's going to be. Certainly, dogs have different genetics. And some dogs, you cut them loose and they just go. And, and I know that happens. I had, uh, we had a, a puppy here named, a dog named Jasper. And he was a big white setter. And Jasper had, uh, he was supposed to have gone to someone else. We had a litter. We had a female named Emma and Jasper and then some of the other dogs in that litter. But Jasper was set to go to a couple. And when, you know, they came, I mean, he was a big, outgoing, uh, vivacious, bold, 
you know, he just looked good. And he he just had a lot of point in him. And that's an important thing for bird dog is that they, you know, you're looking for that early foundation, the genetic foundation. And what I, what I do is, you know, take a, a bird wing on the end of a fishing pole and you put that on the ground and they go in and hit that scent and go into that classic pose, tail up, that sort of thing. You know, often when we'd have a litter here and, and some of the dogs are going home, I do that for the folks just so they kind of see what, what they were getting. And uh, Jasper was pretty. I mean, he, you know, long body and, and a long tail and just looked good. And um, <laughs> until the day that his new potential mom and dad showed up, because I put him and Emma on the ground. Emma was a female setter of that litter. And again, she was kind of flashy and looked good. And we're out uh, in our training area. It's all graveled and, and uh, chain gang off the side and that kind of stuff. And mom and dad, you know, kind of interested. They want to see their new kid. And I bring Jasper out and I put him on the ground. <laughs> and he took one look at them and he said, nope, I'm not going with you. And he went and hid underneath the truck and would not come out. And he knew exactly what was going on. And I, I had a little check cord on him. I reeled him out, you know, and tried to show him a wing. No interest in the wing. <laughs> uh, and went and hid under the truck and uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't warm up to them, wouldn't acknowledge them. He had no intention of going anywhere. But long story short, they opted not to take uh, Jasper home. And he stayed here with us. And he was, he was here till he died. I know with Jasper is that, gosh, he could run. I mean, he could, you put him down and he just cover ground. So we started with long check cord. And for his first season, I'd have him drag, you know, a, a check cord, a length of check cord. I could have him drag that, that heavy pneumatic airline, that the, the stuff that had that, uh, the rubber coating, the biotin type of coating. And that would slow him down a bit. Those are all tools you can use, depending. Either you are going to turn your kid loose, and he doesn't want to go very far, and so all works, and you have that checkboard, and you can walk up and down it and step on it and stop him. Or, you know, this is a dog that's got a lot of run that you have, and you need to kind of rein him in. And so you can do that by putting a, a, a long checkboard that has some length to it that's going to slow him down a bit. But all of it served to slow the dog down, keep them in range, and allow that bridge to take place. And so, you have your kid, you found that piece of geography that's going to work for you, that has some barriers or some lines or something that's going to slow him down or, or direct his uh, course of travel, and then you're going to pick the sort of rope you need. And initially, you probably want a long rope, because you really don't quite know what they're going to do when you cut them loose. And you then can moderate that depending on what you need. But you know you're going to find pretty quick that they'll get it. They'll get it. And they will figure out how to keep track of you. Now, we have other blessings now, too. Uh, in the modern world, we have GPS units that are built into collars. So you can put a GPS on a dog that's designed for that dog. To You, know, you hold a GPS unit in your hand. And that GPS unit will tell you exactly where that dog is, how far away, if he's stopped, if he's running, what he's doing. And if, if it's a real concern for you, if, if, you know, and, and it might be that the genetics on your dog or that they're, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna look for the county line. If that's the case, you know, in the old days we used telemetry gear. You don't need that anymore. Uh, it's amazing with the new genetics, uh, the new GPS stuff that's out there, just how safe it is now. Because you can't hardly lose a dog if you've got a GPS unit on them. And so that is certainly an option. You're going to look for that, that transition. And you will find pretty quick that they'll settle in. They'll figure out how to, how to run and keep track of you. And they'll figure out that their job is not to uh, be attached to you but to go out and, and do all the stuff that they want to do. And in addition, monitor your position and your whereabouts and check in with you. You don't look for a dog. They look for you. And you have to make that point to them. Now, I know that 
you can kind of set these things up. And let's say that, that you've had this kid f- from a youngster, and maybe you raised this puppy, or maybe you got him at you know, three months old or four months old. Dogs go through development stages, different levels of maturity, just like a human growing up. And you're going to find that up through about, depending on the, the genetics of the dog, the, the, the physicality of the dog, up through about five months, they're really pretty dependent on us. And they're looking for us, and, and they're looking to be around us, and they don't feel safe if we're not right there by them. And then you will find that one day the switch will flip and the motor starts turning on and they get a little bit bold and they're, they're thinking about uh, all this, this wonderful world that's floating into their, through their nose now. And they will drift out in front of you and they will get some distance. And you might, you know, a little, a little guy at five months is going to be within a, about 30 feet. Uh, maybe a bit more, but that same puppy at six or seven months is going to be out there zooming. You know, he's going to be out there at 60, 80 yards. And what you want to do while they're young is you want to set up that concept for them. You need to show them in a tangible way that their job is to keep track of you. So as you go for, take your dog out for walks and you make these introductions, and you see them getting a little bit bolder and a little bit bolder. At some point, when they've stretched it out a little bit, and they're clearly not paying attention to you, just sit down. Just drop below the level of the grass or bushes. Hide behind a little something. Get behind a tree. And <laughs> you'll see them. Uh, uh, what a young dog will do is they'll, they're out there on a lark. They're chasing butterflies. The world is wonderful. And as an afterthought, they think about, oh, where's Where's mom or dad? And they turn around and look, and son of a gun, mom and dad are gone. And, and I've, seen, I've seen little guys where they, they look around, they get this panic look on their face, and they, they literally plop down, and then you hear them whimper and whimper and whimper, and then start howling that plaintiff, and let them go for just a little bit, and then show yourself. And you'll see them come running back and connect with them and let them know they're okay and pet them, love them up, and then continue with your walk. And they will get very concerned. And you'll see them get real careful because they don't want you to get lost again, you know. And they may try it, you know, a time or two or three. You do the same thing. And you teach them that there's a distance that they shouldn't go past. Because if they do, you might get lost. Mom and dad might get lost. And that's a good setup to then translate into cutting an, a, an older, an adult dog loose. Uh, you know, they get to nine, ten months old. Their body is kicked in. They got legs. They got a motor. Um, they can cover ground. And if you put some of that early work into them, they already are of the mindset that, you know, mom and dad aren't too bright. They tend to get themselves lost if I don't keep track of them. You know, that helps with that setup. And it might be that the dog came to you after that, and that's fine. You you get it done. And you can try some of that, depending on the genetics of the dog. Some dogs tend to to hang pretty close uh, and and keep focus on you. Some dogs tend to just go. So uh, you're going to have to gauge that. But you do have that option of hang in that check cord and use one that is going to work for you. And maybe you put something on the end of it to slow them down a little bit more um, and to bring them in. All of those are, are kind of a bridge tools to allow you to get to the place where you just turn a dog loose. You're confident that they are a partner with you and they're going to check back in with you and keep uh, apprised of, of your position and return to you. And then the two of you can go out and enjoy your walk. So that's about all I can tell you about a rope. And it's a pretty simple thing. You know, pretty easy to use ultimately. And not that hard to, to outfit and, and get to work the way you need it to work. And just remember, don't use your hands, use your feet, unless you have to hold it with your hands. 
And you can make that the bridge that you need until both you and your dog are comfortable in that free-range environment. So with that, I'm going to wish you a good day. This is Webb Parton. I appreciate you spending time with me today and listening to this conversation about how to use a rope and a dog. Thank you. If you like this episode, I invite you to visit our website, freerangedogs.com. It's where you can find the stuff you need to live the free-range dog lifestyle. I want to help you with that. Book a consultation call or an in-person training, attend one of our ongoing events, or join our online membership program. We got it all on freerangedogs.com. All right, it's time to head back to the truck and the water bucket for the thirsty dogs. This is Webb Parton signing off, wishing you the boundless joy that comes when you share the outdoors with your best friend.